Around this time in the late fall of 29 AD, Jesus also got word that his enemies in Jerusalem were looking for a way to have him arrested and killed. Jesus did not believe that the timing was right for him to confront either Herod in Galilee or the authorities in Jerusalem, so he decided to move east, across the Jordan River, into a region known as the Decapolis to wait through the winter. The Decapolis was outside the borders of Galilee and Judea and was governed by a loose federation of ten Greco-Roman city-states. It was relatively easy for Jesus and his entourage to set up their camp in the mountainous hill country of Gilead and find a measure of solitude and safety. We don't know if he took the larger group of over 100 or just the inner group that he'd taken north to Caesarea Philippi. In 1991, through some textual sleuthing, I was able to locate and visit this Jesus hideout in Jordan, where Jesus and his band of loyal followers possibly spent that last winter. It was one of the most exciting discoveries of my life. The Gospel of John provides us with a clue to the location. He went away again across the Jordan from the place where John had been baptizing earlier, and he remained there. John had been baptizing earlier at Anon near Salim because waters were abundant there. This place can be identified today as Tel Salim. Even today, the rich springs in the area provide water for Israeli fish ponds. Back in 1991, I was studying a map of this area, and I noticed that directly across the Jordan from Tel Salim is a deep ravine or wadi, that in biblical times was the famous Brook Kareth, where Elijah had hidden. I further noticed that Wadi Kareth is just a few miles south of the Decapolis city of Pella. I knew from my reading that when Jesus' followers had fled Jerusalem in 68 AD, just before the Roman siege and the great Jewish revolt, they had fled to the region of Pella. James, the brother of Jesus, had already been killed at that time, and Jesus' brother Simon was leader of the community of Nazarenes. It dawned on me that their choice of the Pella region was not a random one. The group would have viewed the Wadi Kareth as a place of safety, not only because of Elijah being protected and nourished there, but because it is entirely possible that Simon's choice of this place as a destination for the flight from Jerusalem had to do with the time he had spent there with his brother Jesus in the winter of 29 AD. Not long after making these connections, I decided to visit Wadi Kareth. I was amazed at what I discovered. As one moves east along the Wadi, it quickly becomes almost inaccessible with waterfalls and rocks, but after a short distance, it opens into an area surrounded by steep cliffs with many caves, wholly protected from outside access. There were pottery fragments dating to the first century Roman period on the floors of the caves. I tried to imagine Jesus and his small band of followers, likely including his own mother, brothers, and sisters, living there during those crucial final months of his life. In mid-December of 29 AD, Jesus made a daring move. We know the date because the Gospel of John tells us it was winter at the time of the Jewish festival of Hanukkah. Jesus made a clandestine trip to Jerusalem and was almost killed. He'd gone into Herod's temple and was walking in the area called the Portico of Solomon when some of the Jewish authorities cornered him and demanded that he say plainly whether he was the Messiah or not. It was literally a plot to kill. To make such a claim was to declare oneself king. The Romans had zero tolerance for messiahs. They were not considered to be harmless religious fanatics, but potentially seditious enemies of Rome. Jesus' reply, You do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep, so infuriated his enemies that they picked up stones to stone him. John says they tried to arrest him, but he escaped and went back to his hideout across the Jordan. Jesus had so far never publicly said he was Israel's rightful king. For Jesus, timing was everything. He repeatedly told his followers, My time has not yet come. 
He had a specific plan in mind, and at the right time, he would make his move. In mid-March of 30 AD, the time had arrived. Jesus and his entourage headed south down the Jordan River Valley to Jerusalem. It was a three-day trip, and they would have camped out along the way. Passover was near, falling during the first week of April. All of Galilee were on the road, making their way to Jerusalem for Passover. One of the pilgrim stops mentioned by Josephus just at the foot of the Samaritan mountains is still visible along the way, with caves for shelter by the road and a natural spring. They would have reached it the first night. One should picture a group of mixed ages, men and women, with baggage and gear and pack animals. Their social makeup was completely diverse. Most were Galileans, though Jesus had his sympathizers in Judea and Jerusalem. At the core were the twelve, including his brothers, then his mother and sisters, Mary Magdalene, and Salome, the mother of the fishermen James and John. Luke also names Joanna, married to an official in Herod's household named Cusa, and Susanna, women of means who provided funds for the operation. Luke adds that there were many other women in the group. The second night, they would have reached Jericho, just north of the Dead Sea and 15 miles east of Jerusalem. As the group entered Jericho, a huge crowd gathered, and a blind man began to cry out, Jesus of Nazareth, Son of David, have mercy on me. These were revolutionary words. Some of Jesus' followers tried to silence the man, knowing Jesus had forbidden such declarations in the past. Jesus stopped and called the man over and, touching his eyes, said, Receive your sight, your faith has made you well. According to the Gospels, he was instantly healed, joined the band of followers, and the crowd crushing around Jesus became ecstatic with excitement. Jesus at last was ready to permit the open proclamation of his kingship, come what may. The group spent Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath day, in Jericho. Sunday was to prove to be as busy as it would be fateful. It was March 31st, but the 10th of Nisan on the Jewish calendar. Passover began at dusk as the 14th of Nisan ended, which was a Thursday just four days ahead. A final countdown had begun. The Jesus party must have gained quite a bit of attention and lots more people by the time it arrived in the late afternoon at the Mount of Olives. When the group reached the summit at the little village of Bethany on the eastern side, Jesus halted the procession. He sent two of his disciples into the town, telling them to find a donkey's colt and bring it to him. Jesus mounted the animal and slowly made his way down the steep path descending the western side of the Mount of Olives, which overlooked Herod's temple and the heart of the city. His followers began to spread garments in front of the animal as it made its way and as the crowd swelled with excitement, they cut leafy branches from the trees and did the same, creating a royal carpet for the king. Jesus' intention was as obvious as it was deliberate. The prophet Zechariah had written, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, your king comes to you! He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, even upon a colt, the foal of an ass. The time had come, the die was cast. The crowds began to chant explicit messianic slogans, Hosanna to the Son of David, and blessed is the kingdom of our father David that is coming. After arriving at the city, Jesus melted into the crowd. He had carried out the first stage of his plan. His purpose was not to lead a mob in revolt, but to fulfill certain specific biblical prophecies. He returned to Bethany on the Mount of Olives by nightfall, where he, his council of twelve, and the women were staying in the home of two sisters, Mary and Martha, who were supporters of his movement. On Monday morning, Jesus and a select band of his followers made their way down the slopes of the Mount of Olives once again and entered the temple. On the south side of the huge temple compound was an area where the money changers operated 
and where animals that were ritually acceptable for sacrifice were sold. From a Jewish point of view, there was nothing wrong with either of these activities. The popular idea that Jesus subjected to money changing in the temple is incorrect. Jews from all over the world brought coinage of all types as offerings to the temple, and it was necessary to have some standard of evaluation and conversion. There was also a need for people to be able to purchase sacrificial animals right at the temple rather than to try to bring them from afar, especially at Passover when hundreds of thousands of pilgrims required one lamb per household. Some have assumed that the money changing had to do with converting coins with pagan images and slogans to Jewish coinage that was considered religiously acceptable. The very opposite was the case. The only coins accepted at the Jerusalem temple were silver Tyrian shekels and half shekels, which had the image of Hercules on one side and an eagle perched on the bow of a ship on the other. The issue was not pagan images, but consistency of value. Tyrian shekels were guaranteed to be made up of 95% pure silver. The Sadducean priests who ran the temple conveniently argued that the purity of one's offering to God superseded any defilement that the images might bring. At Passover, the money-changing operation was vastly expanded since Moses had commanded that each male Jew over the age of 20 donate a half shekel of silver to the sanctuary once a year. The profit from these activities was enormous. The Jerusalem temple had the most lucrative system of temple commerce in the entire Roman world. As one might expect, there were certain fees and surcharges added to these services, These funds went to support the wealthy class of Sadducean priests who had their lavish homes just west of the temple compound in the area called the Jewish Quarter of the Old City today. These priests in turn worked closely with their Roman sponsors. To understand the economy in Jerusalem, which really was a type of temple state, one needs only to follow the money. Jesus arrived that Monday morning at the very height of the trade season. He had three words on his mind, Zechariah, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. At the very end of Zechariah's sequential scenario of the end times, he declares, And there will no longer be traitors in the house of Yahweh of hosts on that day. Jeremiah had gone into the temple of his day, the first temple built by King Solomon, and declared in the name of Yahweh, Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? And Isaiah had envisioned a time when God's temple at Jerusalem would become a house of prayer for all nations, providing a spiritual center for humanity. Jesus' activities that day were not intended to change things or to spark a revolution. Like his ride down the Mount of Olives on the foal of the donkey, he intended to signal something namely that the imminent overthrow of the corrupt temple system was at hand and the vision of the prophets would be fulfilled. He began to overturn the tables of the money changers and topple the pay stations of those who sat taking money for the sale of the animals. He then quoted the words of Jeremiah and Isaiah as an explanation for his actions. Mark also adds that he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. There were certain narrow gates through which goods had to pass to support the exchange and sales activities, and Jesus stationed several of his rugged Galilean men at these posts and told them business was closed for the day. The priestly leadership heard about the ruckus. They already had been looking for a way to have Jesus arrested and killed. They were more determined than ever to stop him, but they feared the people. The crowd must have been immense that Monday morning and the crush of people cheered on Jesus. This was not a riot for which the priests might call in the Romans. They would be reluctant to do that anyway, since the governor Pontius Pilate was known for his brutal handling of temple crowds and his disdain for the Jews in general. Jesus' actions were a symbolic prophetic protest, and he had the support of the people who were likely tired of paying the prices demanded to fulfill these ritual requirements. 
Mark indicates the siege lasted the entire day, and it was only at evening that Jesus and his men left the city and went back to Bethany for the night. Tuesday was an important day for Jesus and his council of twelve. They openly went back to the temple early that morning, and Jesus spent the entire day verbally sparring with various segments of the temple establishment, including the Sadducean priests, leading Pharisees, and the Herodians, the political supporters of Herod's dynasty. The Pharisees and Herodians asked Jesus whether he supported Roman taxation, perhaps the most sensitive political and religious issue of the day. Holding up a Roman coin, he replied with his now famous but ambiguous retort, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Jesus said two things that day that seemed to epitomize his entire view of true religion. A man asked Jesus which of the commandments of the Torah was the greatest. Jesus quoted the Shema, that great confession of the Jewish faith. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one, and you shall love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. He added that the second greatest commandment was to love one's fellow human being as oneself. The man agreed and observed that if one loved God and loved one's fellow as oneself, that would be much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Jesus then made a surprising statement to the man. You are not far from the kingdom of God. This indicates that Jesus' view of the kingdom of God involved not only the revolutionary overthrow of the kingdoms of the world, but also a certain spiritual insight into what God most desires from human beings. One would not be complete without the other. Throughout the day, the crowds were amazed and thrilled at all Jesus said. The Gospels report repeatedly that Jesus' enemies wanted to arrest him but feared the crowds. The temple officials knew their only hope was to arrest Jesus when he was alone, maybe at night, with only a few of his followers around. Passover was two days away, and they had no idea what Jesus had in mind or of what he might be capable. They determined that they had to act fast.